very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this 79th episode of the Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. Week after week, since April 2020, it has been our privilege to play host to some wonderful thought leaders, various from various walks of life, school principals and esteemed educators, who have shared their thoughts on a variety of subjects. We've tackled very curricular sub subjects, STEM, the new education policy, we have tackled the co-curricular. We've spoken about sports, we've spoken about the arts and the extracurricular. But today, perhaps, we are gonna take a trip out of school and we're gonna talk about excursions and field trips and their importance in our school education system. We have a stellar panel lined up for you. So without much ado, let me introduce to you our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious Dune School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in education. He served the Dune School as housemaster, head of department, dean of activities, dean of student welfare, deputy headmaster, second master, and acting headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College in UK in the year 2000. He's also an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist. Sir, Privileged to have you with us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Bayou, for that introduction. Um, and a very good evening to the entire notebook team of Achin, Shibayu, uh, and Avishek, and all the rest in Calcutta. Also, very good evening to Roy De Silva and Mrs. Rajulu. I'm very glad to see Roy having moved from the audience to the panel. And also, very good evening to all those who have tuned in here today. So. Um, uh, the, the topic is very interesting because uh, I see an excursion, you know, the word excursion is a term that co covers a broad spectrum of outings and tours that schools have to offer their students. It is very important, it's very important and valuable addition to the normal school calendar and has a tremendous academic value and meaning for both teacher and taught. I know these trips involve a great deal of planning teacher time, risk assessment forms have to be filled out, medical boxes and food and water have to be loaded on sometimes, transport has to be arranged. And these trips are not without their problems and dangers, but still the trips are well worth the effort. Now excursions can be of different types. You can have a local excursion where kids go out of school to places of interest in and around the city. These are usually day trips or day and a half trips, or sorry, half day trips, and they suit the younger students. These trips are usually compulsory because they have academic value. Short, short trips to museums, zoos, or even botanical gardens, aquariums, scientific laboratories, planetariums, or even local factories. Maybe to see a good movie is worthwhile. And uh, these are very common in schools, especially day schools. And these give the, the children a chance of getting out of, of schools. You've got to see how children love to get into that bus and go out of the walls or out of the gates of that school. And there's great excitement when they come back and say, there's no books today, we are going out today. Then of course, there are trips that are national trips where students travel out of their city to places of interest in India. Here, slightly older students may benefit more. And these trips could last from a few days to a week or a few weeks. India is a vast country. And so it is very difficult for students in the South to come up to the Himalayas or students from the North to go and see the Konarak temples uh, in the South. A simple rule of thumb that I would use is any place that a student might be able to visit with his parents during a holiday is not worth going on a trip, uh, a school trip for. School trips are usually trips where you do not go with your parents. I remember taking a, a day trip uh, to the Kola Goldfield mines in the 60s when I was in school. And it was a great experience having to go down those mine shops. I think I went about a kilometer and I felt a bit uh, claustrophobic, but it was a very, very interesting and this, this stays with me. You know, at the end of the day, what stays with the student is not so much what happens in the class, but what happens outside the class. 
uh, it's your sporting, you know, sporting events, and especially these excursions. Then you have the international trips, and these have become very common now, and are usually run and organized by large tour companies specializing in historical and cultural and scientific trips. A very popular one these days is the NASA trip. Many schools do this. Uh, we've taken trips to the Shakespeare country in England. Um, we've taken trips to Italy, France, Spain. They offer trips down the Nile in Egypt. Uh, even Mount Kilimanjaro is on their calendar. Many of these tour companies can even customize trips to school requirement. I remember organizing for our school a trip to France for our French students and clubbing this trip with the Tour de France that was going on at the same time. So our students not only uh, saw the Eiffel Tower and the Champs Elysees and the Louvre and lived with French families, but they also got a glimpse of the tour as it tra you know, traveled through the, the countryside. Now these trips obviously are not, they are optional. They can't be made compulsory and they could last from a, a few weeks to almost a month sometimes. The problem with these international trips is that not all students can afford it. And there could be a sense of equality that sets in because some kids can take the trip and you know some kids can't. Hence schools need to have a budget kept aside to subsidize these trips for the children who may not be able to afford it. Trips may be cultural, geographic, historical, aesthetic, even sporting and adventure trips. And more than doing something for the children, they are also a great learning experience for the teachers accompanying these parties. Because I think there's so much to learn and teach while eating out at restaurants, taking buses in strange cities, boarding flights, checking into hotels, interacting with other types of students from different backgrounds and much more. And of course, while the main objective of these trips is educational and learning, it is not without its fun. Memorable experiences and a lot of photographs are taken and these experiences stay with our students for the rest of their lives. And I, of course, I, I was very lucky at Doon to, to, to go on many of these trips. I escorted a, a trip to Pakistan, to our, our sister school or brother school in, in Lahore, outside Lahore, called Chanbad. We took a cricket, soccer, and a basketball team, also a music team with them. And this was in the 1990s, you know, when things were much easier across the border. And just filling in those forms at Wagga and walking across with our suitcases to catch the, the buses that took us to Lahore was in itself an experience, just the border crossing, let alone traveling in the city. You know, uh, we of course had a lot of security with us all the time. I've also taken trips to Canada and the US and uh, my boys and I have walked the Golden Gate Bridge, visited Alcatraz and, and taken the cable car, you know, in, trans in San Francisco. Um, now, these trips, as I said earlier, lead to a lot of bonding and real connect between teacher and student. And this also involves planning on the part of the student. You, these trips are best done when the students get involved in what they want to learn, where they want to go. A lot is learned about leadership, caring for others, responsibility, punctuality how to manage the limited money that is given them for their daily allowance. Also internationalism, there's a healthy respect for other cultures. And I must add that there's also much danger with strange people around these children and they have to handle their lives on, on trips like these. We need to teach them how to navigate these difficult streets, how to have eyes behind the back of their heads. I know we were taken through an entire course on disaster management by a, by, a, by a company, which told us about the dangers that we might face when we check into hotels and travel abroad. Um, and, that, and this is what we um, impart to our children. Uh, I must narrate a very funny story about a trip I took with a boy, the group of boys to Boston to visit a school there that we were exchanging with. And, uh, my suitcase didn't come off the flight to Boston. And I had uh, to borrow, a, you know, I had to buy a toothbrush and I lived in the clothes that I was in. And my students, of course, lent me their blazers and ties and I had shirts that, that could fit me for almost four days. 
I lived off students' clothes till my suitcase arrived. That itself was a learning experience. Now, one school I know even plans trips for children to seek careers, to help them in their careers. Uh, it's called a day out in the life of a banker or a shopkeeper. And uh, these, these children went to banks, to hospitals, to large departmental stores, to a lawyer's chamber and spent time looking around, sitting around, listening to what the day in the life of these professionals looked like. This could also be a part of an excursion. And trips and visits to historical places of interest are costly and usually offered in the holidays. But international trips are the ones that have really caught the interest of students um, over the last few years. Now, these trips that I add, added earlier also give the teachers an opportunity of taking learning outside the classroom and making it fun. The huge pedagogical value in these trips as teachers and students mix around. Uh, you can prepare questionnaires, you can prepare survey sheets so that students who go around fill up these forms, fill up these sheets and, you know, then do a little quiz when they get back um, to class. Uh, these trips could be around a subject or a topic they're learning, a geographical topic, a historical topic. Um, talking about trips and excursions, I even once led um, 10 member, 10 staff uh, on motorbikes. And uh, this trip was entirely sponsored by my school. And I led a team of 10 teachers in three cars from Dehradun to Gujarat to Diu. And uh, we stopped off at all the forts. We saw the historical places in Madhya Pradesh. It was a fantastic trip. And many of these colleagues of mine who, I, who I'm still in touch with long for a similar trip like this. But alas, times have gone, changed, and I have left my old school. There are two other trips and excursions that I'd like to mention before closing. One is an adventure trip. Now, these adventure trips are most common in residential schools, which are located in the hills of Uttarakhand or Himachal Pradesh, West Bengal, or even the southern hills like the Nilgiris, where students have access to a variety of treks, beautiful treks. And, um, uh, you know, in our school, we had two midterm, midterm treks a year. These were between five to seven days. And uh, uh, this is not the treks that happen in the holidays. We do have holiday treks too, but these are two mountain peaks about 19, 20,000 feet above sea level. These are for a few select trained boys and professional staff. I'm talking about the entire school leaving the campus for five to seven days, twice a year. And uh, I've enjoyed about almost 50 of these treks in my 35 years at the Doon School. Um, and I think these treks are some are some of the biggest and, and the best learning experiences for our boys. Um, some of our summer treks and ex expeditions have taken boys to the Everest base camp. Um, they've been cycling to Leh in Ladakh. They've done the Thar Desert Walk. Uh, there have been excursions to national parks all over the country, wildlife parks. And uh, many progressive day schools also have seen the value of and character building uh, essence of these trips and have uh, added summer and winter trips into their annual calendar. Um, many metro schools offer treks into the mountains and deserts uh, with the help of professional tour operators, as, as I said. Um, <clears throat> now, another and the last type of excursion I would like to mention, uh, this is not very common, is um, in the form of student exchanges, where a school can link up with a school abroad or in India, and students of these schools can exchange. Up to 20 to 30 students can do a week between a week and a month's exchange during best time is after the board exams in class 10. So you get a boy from class 10 before he's really settles into class 11. They can stay in another school for about a week to three weeks and they learn so much and they bring so much learning back into school, which they can, you know, incorporate. In fact, the international award for young people and the IB exams encourage people 
to do adventure. And these trips, these excursions are a part of the built-in uh, curriculum of the IB and the International Award for Young People that many schools do. Um, I must end by saying that a lot of foreign teachers who've been to Dune, uh, who have been on our midterms, feel that we don't take enough care, we are risky, we do not do enough risk assessment. And um, they've always said that we need to be more careful. We, on the other hand, feel that in schools abroad, they are overcautious. Their overcaution actually you know, stifles the, natural, um, the naturalness of our trip. And I think the truth lies somewhere between. So we must plan somewhere between. We can't be too foolhardy on one side, nor can we be too overcautious on one side. And if a trip is well planned, well thought of, and the students like it and want it, there's nothing better in the educational world than an excursion. And with that, Subayu, I must hand this over to you. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, like every other week, we stand to benefit from your experiences. And uh, I had a feeling that when we had picked this topic, that this would be one of your favorites, given your love for nature and hiking. But ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to introduce our second speaker for today. Our second speaker today is Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, Ochin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. Ochin has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. He is a fellow of the ICAI and a member of CPA Australia. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. Ochin is an avid reader and a passionate traveler with keen interest in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He's a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce, and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Ochit, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Shubha, am I audible? Loud and clear. I once again welcome all of you to today's session on a topic which brings a smile. As you remember, our good old lives before this pandemic. You know, if we just take a step back and think as to what do we really remember from our school days and what really caused us to be what we are today, chances are either a group project, uh, a special speaker whom, whom we listen to somewhere, or a field trip helped many of us decide the future course of action. It may have been something you did on your own outside of school or after learning about a given topic. There's something that sparked our passion or curiosity, which pushed us to take our learning to the next level. Now, every student comes to their classroom with a different world experience. We know that students who have been exposed to many different things, most of the times do better in schools because there's a, there's a great correlation between exposure and performance. And even in order to be successful, in terms of retention when we read something. It really helps if students can relate what they read to what they actually experienced firsthand. To think broadly, you know, it's very important to have a broad range or a, or a variety of experiences. Thus, there's no doubt about it that field trips are very important. In fact, it is one of the best tools that we can use to provide every student with real life experiences. Whether a trip to a waterfront park, a library, a museum, or an overnight excursion to a historic place, trying to experience nature, or something as small as a trip to a community garden. Each experience that a student participates contributes to their understanding of the world. And when a student leaves the classroom, 
they really see the connections between what is happening in school and what is happening in real world. They begin to see that what they learn within the walls of the classroom can help them solve problems they see in real world around them and can have a direct impact. They, they really understand that they can actually make a difference. Now, our communities or society, I guess, are one of the most important places to learn from. And these tips really help students to experience it firsthand. So the, so the entire feeling of being able to see and touch historical artifacts in person, or for instance, meeting someone, you know, really important, listening to a, a, a public speaker in a public stage, each experience solidifies learning and supports important academic concepts. Even, as, even I was going through a very uh, interesting study conducted by the University of Arkansas, which, which concluded that students who go on field trips become more, more empathetic and tolerant. So it really increases the degree of tolerance, opens you to the entire world. You understand diversity in terms of culture, in terms of living habits. And it also found that students who made field trips to art museums show increased empathy, tolerance, and critical thinking skills. Because something like studying art really gives students a chance to think about a topic or theme from a very different perspective. Even in terms of academic impact, how do these trips really help in terms of academic impact? Again, I saw a very, uh, very recent and interesting study by Emeline Rubel, which shows that field-based learning increases test scores. And this study was conducted with middle school students who participated in science field trips. So there was a program called Urban Advantage Program to this, this, this was conducted. And it is really showed that hands-on learning and field trips makes a world of difference. Additionally, they're also important because they're really engaging. Since concepts are presented in a much more hands-on way and naturally very different from traditional learning, so memory retention is far better. It's much more holistic. Learning is much more holistic. And when they go back to school and study the same topic, they're able to relate to it, which really makes a world of difference. Now, today, especially during the, in the middle of this pandemic, and even, I'll say as a society, when we are becoming increasingly risk averse, we need to come to the terms with the fact that life indeed is full of challenges. And it is important to equip our children with the skills which are important or which are necessary to recognize risks, assess them sensibly, and react positively. Now, these trips really provide a great opportunity for students to gain such experience and face a range of challenges that can contribute significantly to their personal development. Even in terms of a peer-to-peer -peer interaction or interaction with teachers, the entire experience of living with them in a residential community, even for a few days, adds a completely new dimension. It, raises, it really raises the bar in terms of interpersonal skills, and develop skills like leadership, teamwork, trust, and respect, which are so important. And also issues concerning, for instance, uh, 
development of self confidence self esteem resilience now very often we have seen that after coming back from such trips and as going through this particular study we said with case studies after coming back from trip students who were normally little hesitant to open up especially students who have taken transfer joined into middle school little hesitant to open up they really opened up and did great so they really help in terms of improving performance and relationships back at school so and i'm sure so that the advantage is tremendous in today's in today's world especially in the middle of this pandemic there are the concept of virtual field trips and i was going through some very interesting incidents and literature on this so i i saw a particular uh, a particular uh, case study which i wanted to share with all of you with regard to school trips in japan and how they went virtual during the pandemic as you all know that pandemic has really changed everything right from the way children are studying online uh to in terms of teaching aids but one very important tradition which is a very well loved tradition all over the world and in japan i so i i was going through that school trips are one of the most beloved tradition now what has been done recently and not only in japan i was seeing such similar instances all over the world multi day in person school trips are not an option and and, and we we live with that as of now standing where we are today but excursions are being really conducted on a new platform where technology is being deployed so students were sitting in classroom or sitting in their own homes are being given a safe simulation of the real thing since actual actually visiting those places hitting the road is not possible out of bounds now while many schools have cancelled or postponed outing due to global health crisis this remote trips which which really allow students to participate in cultural activities and sightseeing have become very popular and very often so i was going to some popular destinations that children in, in school children in japan japanese capital tokyo historical and cultural hubs of kyoto and nara in western japan hiroshima and nagasaki uh, the cities that suffered from us atomic bombing world war 2 and even even hokkaido in north or okiwara in south now what is really important is to see that of course uh, in person experience naturally adds a different dimension all together that that's completely there's no argument about it that it's a far more enriching experience but given the limitations given where, where where we are today and given the practical challenges that we face i think virtual trips are something which really adds value to children so as 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 going to some very small uh, feedbacks also the students have given very interesting feedback as to how and i'm discussing about this particular case study in japan using video conferencing third grade students third grade students at a particular junior high school they took the world heritage listed yakushiji temple in nara and they were guided by a monk who explained the notable features of the buddhist temple with an approximately 1300 year old history the students were listening to the talk from the monk on on buddhist teachings with lessons emphasizing the importance of perceptions and having a positive attitude during pandemic which is so important to counter all the all the challenges and negativity so undoubtedly as i told you that it's, it's an invaluable memory and so effective in terms of education in terms of wholesome and holistic education and overall growth and also as going through uh in closer home as going through some recent happenings in delhi in a step 
aimed at resurrecting both tourism sector and revenue generation, which are affected by lockdown. The Directorate of Education plans to encourage students to virtually learn about the heritage of Delhi. So, virtually, virtual learning about the heritage of the capital, which at a later point of time will be followed by trips and excursion. Now, there's a circular that, that issued by Department of Education who said that students need to be equipped for learning through virtual mode. So, steps are being taken all over the world in, in this particular regard. And I guess Bites also made some very interesting observations and shared some of his own experiences. We are very uh, experienced and distinguished panel today, a very varied panel. So I look forward to their deliberations on this very interesting topic. I thank all of you for giving me a patient hearing. Over to you, Shubhai. Thank you, Akin. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to introduce you to the panel. But before that, if I may take a minute of your time to tell you a little bit about Notebook. We at Notebook are an edtech organization. The way we operate is that we take every single topic of every subject from the school curriculum and make those into short, crisp videos. Now, these videos come in handy in two cases. One is when you as teachers are taking your classes, whether online or offline, you can play these videos as a part of your class. These will help the students get a more visual understanding of the topic that you're presenting and also create memory aids for months later when they start revising this chapter before an exam, they can access these same videos on their home systems, be it a smartphone or a laptop or whatever device they have, they have access to. They will watch these same videos that were played in class and not only will it help them revise the topic, but also remind them of exactly those things that you had said in class that day. Given our topic for today, we decided why not play a small sample clip from a topic called Madam Rides the Bus. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was a small sample of one of the notebook videos. There are more than 10,000 such videos at your disposal, should you choose to use them during your class. And it is now time to introduce to you the stellar panel that we have for you today. We have with us today, Mr. Roy De Silva. Mr. De Silva is the principal of the St. Stephen's School in Toga near Chandigarh for the past 13 years. Prior to this, he has nearly three decades of experience in mainstream education in various schools in India and abroad. He holds a master's degree in English and Bible study. His passion is reading, music, and quizzing, and he takes personal interest in each child's all-round development. He conducts seminars, both for teachers as well as students. During this COVID-19 lockdown, he has personally guided the online classes throughout the school. His firm, yet gentle counseling from time to time, has abated the apprehensions of both students and parents 
resulting in great success of the online learning program. He is lovingly referred to by the students as the walking encyclopedia and has traveled extensively and has in-depth knowledge of peoples and cultures across the world. His leadership skills are greatly sought after and he is known as a principal par excellence. Sir, privileged to have you with us today. We also have with us Mrs. Sulochila Rajini. She started her career as a physics PGT at APS Bangalore. Being married to an army officer, she got to work in schools across the country. She has served in the capacity of a vice principal and officiating principal in various army schools. She has worked in Kendriya Vidyalayas and Jawahar Navodhya Vidyalayas in various capacities and is a resource person for workshops organized by NCERT. She is currently serving as the founder principal at the Amatra Academy, a part of the prestigious PEL group of institutions from its inception in 2012. Ma'am, thank you so much for being here. We also have with us Pratima. Pratima is from Chennai and her love for the Himalaya started with the Kashmir Great Lakes trek back in 2012. This trek left a deep impact on her and transformed her in mind, body and spirit. She wanted a trek to impact others the same way it impacted her. She wanted a trek to impact others the same way it impacted her. This influenced her to join India Heights as an experienced coordinator. For over seven years at India Heights, she has interacted with thousands of trekkers, coordinated several treks for many families and children, and helped facilitate successful treks for all of them. In January 2021, she was part of a trek leading teams to India Heights' first Western campus trek in Kajat in Maharashtra. The team of 30 consisted of families with their children as young as six years old, which was a two-night experiential learning camp with a trek to Kothaligarh and her first as a trek leader. She has been on a few Himalayan treks like Annapurna Base Camp, Rupkund, Rupin Pass, Sandakfu, and Hamta Pass and Pinbhavar Pass trek, to name a few. She has also run various half marathons and several 10-kilometer races. Pratima, thank you so much for joining. I will now stop my share so that uh, we can all see each other. I hope I'm uh, audible and visible to all of you. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining. Uh, Sulachana, ma'am, if you're there. Yes, we can all see you now. Thank you so much. Uh, my first question, and this is not so much a question, I'll just go across the table. And I would ask you to recount your favorite moment from a school field trip. This could be as you as a student or as you as a teacher. But we'll start with um, Roy sir first. Yes, good evening, everyone, and uh, I'm very happy to be back on this uh, panel after several months. I'm uh, in awe of uh, Team Notebook for the way they've held out their webinars week after week, and it's not easy to uh, maintain this overall freshness uh, time and again. So I need to really congratulate uh, Ochin, Shabayu, uh, Philip, of course, who uh, participates in every one of these web webinars, not forgetting uh, Abhishek and uh, Meghna and so many others behind the scenes that are involved in a task of this magnitude. You know, uh, what I like about what you have done is the tro topics that are uh, shared are broadly outlined, giving the panelists the freedom to explore and allow the topic to unfold. And so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, talking about trips, well, I've uh, grown up in a boarding school. I've also been heading a school, as you just mentioned. And uh, I think one of the nicest times I had with uh, uh, taking children on a trip was in your own city of Kolkata, where I took them uh, along the Hooghly. That means we traveled by ferry boat. I took them to the botanical gardens. On the way back, we visited, uh, I think it was the Birla Planetarium. I'm not sure of the name of that. And then, of course, a, a good meal out. That's very important for children. And then back we came. So that was a day excursion. Uh, I would recount that as one of my uh, most uh, kind of memorable ones because that was a time before excursions became commercialized. We mustn't forget that a whole commercial angle has come into these excursions. Um, having said that, uh, I would like to look at this whole uh, study of excursion uh, from its uh, etymology, where uh, in Latin, this uh, word excursion is ex 
and kurere, X means to come out, and kurere means to run. That's not what we do at the moment, but we look at it as field trips and educational tours. But an integral part of it is the presence of student and teacher for the purpose of first-hand observation, where the experiences outside their everyday life and activities are so important. And both teachers and students need to be part of it to reinforce and broaden the topic. Um, listening to uh, Philip and Ochin, I'd like to just maybe hone some of my thoughts after listening to them. We have uh, schools in urban, semi-urban, rural areas. All these need to be part of this outdoor life uh, to direct the understanding of any site or topic in a, in a very specialized manner. Uh, Philip, uh, I was so glad that he tried to bring in, you know, the different elements. And uh, while I was preparing for this webinar, I tried to conceptualize uh, excursions in a series of ever widening concentric circles. Uh, let's begin with, uh, you know, sometimes we think of excursions as only with the senior students. No, we shouldn't neglect the, the babies of our school, the preschool. Even a simple thing as a nature walk in a school campus itself for these toddlers or a visit to your fruit garden or a vegetable garden, a kitchen garden, a herbal garden, a nearby park. For a pre-nursery class, a visit to the school office, they would be awestruck there to see that the ladies working away and then the technology there in front of them, maybe to the local market. So now I'm increasing the circle or a farm, or a factory, a museum, an art gallery, a botanical garden, wildlife sanctuary, uh, over against a zoological park. You know, students are visual learners, and uh, a field trip lets them use their senses to the maximum. They see, touch, feel, smell, listen to what they are learning about. It helps them build on the classroom instruction, gain a better understanding of topics, build cultural understanding and tolerance and expose them to worlds outside their own. It gives us an opportunity to break the mold of the frog in a well mentality. And that can happen with, uh, let's call them ordinary schools or affluent schools. Sometimes there is that ego culture, the frog in a well mentality uh, needs to be shattered. And experiences such as this are uh, very valuable. I have a lot more to share. I'd let uh, uh, Subhachana and Pratima, I'm so glad that I'm part of this panel. I uh, would love to hear what they have to say. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, of course, I was waiting for you to get to the meal bit when you said a trip to Calcutta, because that is not just about an excursion to Calcutta, that is the Calcutta experience. Uh, so, Lachana, if I may come to you next, your favorite uh, experience on a field trip. Ma'am, you're on mute. Yeah. Good evening, Team Notebook. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Team Notebook for giving me an opportunity to be in a platform like this, wherein I'm sharing a uh, stage with all the esteemed speakers. And uh, Philip, sir, and Roy, sir, and of course, Achim, sir, have already covered all of it. They have made it an exhaustive uh, I would say informative uh, uh, speech or rather address that there's nothing for me to say now because everything has been covered by them. But nevertheless, I would like to share my experience. Now, no sooner we say excursion, you know what happens for both a child as well as a teacher. It is like excitement. We are forced to be a little more contained but the little ones express it openly. That's a difference. Otherwise, it brings the same joy. And I would say it is the best teaching method that one can use in order to, you know, get all the other teaching methodologies incorporated, right from experiential learning, hands-on, or even activity-based, all of them are incorporated in this. So it being such a wonderful tool, it gives, one, a real world experience. Now, let me just 
go down my own memory lane and then tell you about how I felt when I first went to a botanical garden, Lal Bagh, all excited. And we were told that we are going to work on herbarium sheets. So when we were told that we are going to work on herbarium sheets, we were so curious about simple things like how do leaves look? Okay, why is this leaf so spiky while this one so thick or why is this one so broad? So that is how our curiosity or observational capacity started increasing and we started also incorporating critical thinking without even knowing what these terminologies are. And we were doing an excellent job by going and collecting specimens and showing our teacher, ma'am, I got this, sir, I got this. So when we were showing it, they were helping us in categorizing it family-wise and saying, you know, this is this species and you can make out these are the characteristics of this species. So we learned a lot. Okay, if I'm talking about soil and I say, then what is the characteristic trait there? So we learned in probably about half an hour, the entire thing about family, Zai, uh, your uh, species and all that we learned in no time. This is back then as a school kid. So what would have otherwise taken me, I think, um, I don't know how many readings in order to understand what is this all about? to learn diversity in no time was what I learned in my first experience. So we started thinking as teachers and as, of course, as administrators, yes, this is the best teaching methodology that we can use in order to excite our children. And when I say excite our children, it means all the learning skills taken into account. So the learning becomes so holistic we were able to incorporate in our children virtues like leadership, tolerance, and uh, you know, discipline, and also helping them to become more responsible. We identified the naughtiest child and we said, you are going to take care of our funds. And to our own surprise, that child took care of the entire fund part for the trip. So we had repost in that child confidence, a value which otherwise is very difficult. This child in a competitive environment in the classroom would have never ever got to learn this particular trait of his. He discovered it en route that yes, I can do it. And we could build positivity in that child by saying that child, you're blessed. You managed the show so well. So this is something which I'm sure in a classroom scenario the child wouldn't have learned so he from then on started exhibiting leadership and being proactive wanting to take up responsibilities and uh, he would start coming and telling us ma'am I will do the time management for the next event and he would chalk out the entire thing without any assistance from us so this is something which I'm sure I wouldn't have been able to instill in that child. So excursions for me is a platform which helps us to take the children away from that pampered environment of their homes and helping them to adapt and also instill confidence in them. So in the bargain, they start synchronizing work in resonance and also they start respecting each other. The bond gets stronger. So this is something I saw in the, uh, in the field trip that we venture out for, a small one, not like the international kinds. It was a simple trip to Goa, that is it. The children started helping each other. Then they were all the while wanting to know about the heritage of that place, about the culture they follow, how are the Goans so broad-minded? So these are things which I saw happening and falling in place. So we went to the churches there and the students started appreciating the architecture part of it, the heritage part of it, and observing closely. So it just fell in place. Like we didn't have to spend hours together teaching in a classroom when they got it all in no time. And some of them started also saying that, 
you know, if I want to take up a career, it would be a career wherein I can be close to the archaeology part of it. When we went to uh, uh, this church and saw Francis Xavier Church, wherein it was, uh, you know, the coffin was placed. And so they wanted to dwell deeper. So these things are something I would say is a take home for life. And when these children came back to school, we found that they fondly remember only one thing the school offered them. Ma'am, that trip helped us to bond better and it instilled in us so many values. They forgot what we did in the classroom. It was just that field trip, which was, uh, I would say, the visual memory of it had ingrained in them a lot of learning. So yes, field trip will continue to be the most powerful tool for teaching, but we can make it even more effective, I feel, by probably having a video, like Achin sir said, we can have a video of the place we are going to take the children to, and then the children start um, you know, getting even more curious and excited to see the place because they've already seen it in the video and they are all eyes for what they need to watch. So a guided questionnaire will help them better and probably a quiz after the um, a trip will help them to, you know, take in as much as they can. The takeaway will be very, very rich. So this is what I feel will help a child in uh, maximizing or cashing upon his simple trip to a place. Thank you. Wonderful, ma'am. Thank you for that. Uh, Pratima, if I may come to you next. Uh, you have an unfair advantage with this particular question because some of the names that I listed out while introducing you, I was visualizing being there myself. And okay. yeah, you have a very envious list over there. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here, Notebook. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, with all the other panelists. Um, I want to start uh, by saying uh, children need to spend time in the wilderness. Uh, they need to have an excursion in the mountains. At India Hikes, we strongly believe that children need to spend more time outdoors. Unfortunately, uh, the pandemic has forced all of us to stay indoors for safety reasons. With uh, the schools closing, the states shut down, human connection has become completely virtual. Weeks of indoor isolation have led to loneliness levels increasing, anxiety, depression. So many other issues have cropped up. What students need is an experiential learning trip in the wilderness. It's an opportunity to look inwards, to connect better with themselves, with their families, with their friends, and also the great outdoors. Studies have shown that 15 minute walk in the park can improve memory and attention by almost 20%. In fact, it is found that after a walk, individuals with clinical depression show even stronger improvement in memory and attention compared to other participants. From parental reports, we found that, that children uh, grew up having more nature around them or they did activities in nature. Their attention power was much, much better than others. Even very young children tend to do very well in the wilderness. Once they're out there, they sort of feel that, you know, they are in their elements. They seem very natural. It's very natural for them to be in the outdoors. And they naturally love it. They love being in the outdoors. We at India Heights believe that there is no better learning than from the outdoors. So we have a lot of experiences. Our experiences can be on Himalayan treks. It can be a one night camping in the close by hills. It can be a day trek going in the morning, coming back in the afternoon on the evening or it can be even camping in school. We call it camp in camp. And we take care of all these experiences with the utmost safety. We ensure that all the children are completely safe. So there is no issue of safety at all. Uh, the parents, the teachers, you know, don't have to feel very unsafe when they're coming with India hikes. Uh, I want to talk about the benefits of experiential learning. Uh, I think most of the panelists have already spoken about it. Uh, when students join us, they sign up not for only a trek, but for a whole India Heights experience. Our experiential learning program, it builds confidence and skills in kids of all ages. We take kids as young as even six years old on treks. Of course, not the high altitude treks, but lower treks of maybe two days or even four days. On our programs, students not only trek, they set up camp, they pitch tents, they cook, they wash, they clean the trail, and they do all the activities together. They do things that they have never done before. 
I've seen them with my own eyes. I've seen them helping each other, sharing their food. They're struggling together. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, they cooperate and they achieve their goals together. And all this while they have so much fun doing all this in the outdoors. As part of keeping the mountains clean, uh, we also give them eco bags to keep all the non-degradable waste. At campsites, they segregate the waste and they have sessions with a trek leader where they can do uh, what they can do on the environment in their lives when they go back home. We call this experience the green trails. Uh, and on every trek, uh, we conduct reflective sessions with our team that results in deep learning that changes the way the students see themselves, the world and the place they live in. At the end of the program, we have witnessed such transformational changes in the students. The changes are not small. They are life-changing experiences. Students have become more resilient. They have learned how to deal with hardship. They get accustomed to it. And they develop that inner confidence and become physically and mentally much stronger than they were before. They get out of their comfort zone and they tackle such difficult situations, which they might have never faced in their lives, in their city, in their home, or even in their school. It gives the students the confidence to face new challenges in real life. On our program, they learn teamwork and their leadership skills become stronger. What we do is we sometimes we pick a weak child or a shy child and we make him the leader of a small group. So the added responsibility builds his confidence. And at the end of the program, we find that there's so much change in this child who was first very shy of, uh, you know, an introvert. It, uh, these programs also uh, build a strong connection with nature and they begin to respect nature. For some of the students, a trek might be their first experience outdoors. It may be even the first time that they're listening to the bird sounds or even gazing at the night skies. I have been part of several of these programs and I've witnessed the changes the students go through. I've seen children overcome the cold, taking lead, making decisions, taking care of each other, pitching tents. I've seen students engrossed in drawing the mountain views and even picking up litter with such enthusiasm. They take away a lot to their homes and cities and their respective and become responsible children. The learnings are immense. They discover themselves and the memories just last forever. Thank you so much. Thanks for that, Pratima. Uh, great to know what India Hikes is doing. I will, however, come back to my original question. Your favorite uh, experience in the outdoors. Okay. Um, so recently we had conducted a trek uh, for families and children. Uh, I was part of that experience. Uh, it was at Karjat. Uh, we were part of the uh, program. It was a three-day learning program. And uh, we had families and uh, children as young as six years old who had come there. And um, it was a group of 30. And uh, we had a lot of learning experiences on the trek where uh, we, we, you know, uh, we got all the kids together. We divided them into smaller groups. And uh, we told uh, one of the kids that they have to take up certain responsibilities. Like one was part of the kitchen, one was part of the cooking, one was part of, uh, you know, making sure the campsite was clean. And uh, it was really so nice to see all the children so enthusiastic. Even when I never used to call them out, they used to, you know, come forward, take up responsibilities, make sure that their parents are getting up on time, coming out of their tents, making sure the food was ready. And uh, it was so nice to see the children take up the leadership qualities without you know, having to be instructed or told anything. And um, sometimes when we were just sitting around and there was nothing to do per se, we would you know, have reflections and talk to all the parents. And the parents were so overwhelmed seeing the children take up so much responsibility. I think uh, the parents felt that uh, you know, uh, in their homes, uh, they were not given this responsibility and uh, they never had a chance for their children to you know, come up and take up all these things. And uh, so many parents were actually moved to tears, uh, seeing the children, you know, braving the, the weather, you know, going up on the trek and coming back, getting up at five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning, uh, especially one father was telling us it's the first time I'm coming out with my children on such an experience. And I never knew my child has grown up. I could, you know, feel his emotions there. So I think being part of this uh, experiential learning program, part of these treks, being with the students, being with children, uh, it's a very overwhelming experience for not only the parents and the children, but also for us, because we're seeing the changes in front of our eyes. A child who was very shy on first day, uh, on the third day or the second day, he's so confident about himself. He's able to speak, he's able to take up responsibility. So I think that one change 
is possible because of the environment they are in. Like you mentioned, uh, there's not much of competition there. They are in, a, in an environment where you know they are happy, they're free, uh, they run around. There's no uh, peer pressure there. So it's really nice to see this change, transformation change in children. So this was my recent experience in January when I went for this uh, Tech to Kajar. So I can relate a lot to what the other uh, professors and the teachers are talking here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pratima. Uh, Roy sir, I'll come to you. You are uh, perhaps sitting in the most enviable geographical location for excursions. You are a few kilometers away from the Narkanda apple orchards or the Shimla hills. So what do you see as the advantages and more importantly, are there any disadvantages to this whole idea of field trips and excursions? Has to have two sides, right? Yes, uh, it was wonderful to listen to uh, Pratima and her experience and uh, uh, Silochana describing her favorite uh, uh, trip to Goa. I'm sure her students also enjoyed the Goan uh, cuisine and uh, that was not to be missed. I just like to share some, uh, to, to answer your question in a broader manner. Uh, the Council for Learning outside the classroom uh, says this, we believe that every child should be given the opportunity to experience life and lessons beyond the classroom walls as a regular part of growing up. These experiences expand the horizons of young people, opening their eyes to the wonders of areas such as art, heritage, culture, adven adventure, and the natural world. I mean, there's so much there. So I, uh, to answer your question now directly, uh, what, are, what are the advantages, disadvantages? In fact, before preparing for this webinar, I put down some uh, trip tricks, a uh, bit of a tongue twister, uh, before, during, and after a trip. So let's look at, okay, whether it's Shimla or any other place. I'll try and give some examples as we go along. It's very essential for a person in my position to have advanced planning and preparation of whatever type. And the main thing is the objective of the trip. And it needs to have multiple objectives, not just one. Because if we are taking a group of students and, and teachers, uh, we want to ensure that everyone gets something out of it, uh, rather than making it very pointed. So multiple objectives are desirable and beneficial. So as I shared earlier, the travel by the ferry boat to the botanical garden, to the planetarium and the meal, let's go back there. For some of them, it was their first time in a boat. They had some concerns. Once they entered that, uh, the safety area of the boat, they, they, they were reassured that they've got these vests and that uh, even though it looks like a very rickety kind of a thing, no, there is a very safe element in it and it's to be enjoyed and to be relaxed and so on. Uh, then of course to the garden and then the planetarium and then the meal as I just uh, outlined for you. Every child will end up taking something from an occasion like that or a visit to a science city clubbed with visits to a religious and historical site on the way back. We've done that as well. And we went to the Kapultala uh, science city and then on the way back uh, stopped at uh, uh, Guru Dwara, which was of uh, a very religious importance. And I think it was Lothal or someplace which has some uh, Indus Valley uh, connection. Or a visit to an art gallery, an aquarium, uh, clubbed with a movie maybe uh, of educational value. So these sort of things I think we need to look at. Uh, budgeting and cost cutting is very, very essential in today's world. They need to get value for money. Uh, it would not be wrong to say that parents uh, need to be reassured that what they are spending, their children will be benefiting from that. And so uh, that sort of a thing now, as, as I mentioned in my earlier intervention, it's becoming more and more commercialized. And we as heads of schools need to look at that in a, in a deeper manner. Uh, preparing students for the trip in all possible ways and securing parental consent in today's scenario is absolutely essential. Uh, we may have students who have got some allergy issues or food concerns. All those things need to be outlined. It can sometimes be overlooked and it can be very detrimental. So I'm just, I'm sure uh, Suloshana Ma'am has experienced it in her own uh, work and uh, Pratima would have been also looking at it very closely because these things cannot be neglected. The health and safety issues, very essential. 
and also the thrill of enjoying uh, the new food experience. Uh, some of them have concerns. Uh, we had cases where I took a trip and uh, the majority of them were vegetarians, but when it came to the buffet, they were very reluctant. They only sampled what they had uh, been familiar with on the first, uh, I still remember when I took them to, I think it was Kathmandu. My goodness, the breakfast spread was amazing. And when I saw the children, they were just picking up the paratha and having it because that's what they are used to. So I uh, instructed the, 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 the restaurant manager to just wait on till I came and I almost trained them to see what it was and what they were allowed to consume and what probably their own um, background did not permit them. But that did not mean that they just confined themselves themselves to something that was that they were accustomed to. So food habits, exploring the new, uh, the, the fun, there has to be a fun element in it. And that has to be planned. Fun will not just emerge unless it has been uh, planned by the organizers, whether it is a mountainous uh, trip or something on the seaside, keeping in mind the safety elements. Uh, we also need to plan meaningful group activities which are interwoven in the trip. It has to be planned. Things will not just happen because if they do just happen on their own, the students who are uh, more extroverted will take over and the introverted ones will be neglected. We need to be aware of that. So if, if the activities are planned beforehand, then all of them become a part of it. I'm sharing from my experience as uh, in my position and also in my educational experience. We also need to leave some focused time for a healthy interaction among the students and organizers sometime midway during the trip. There needs to be the uncertain unknown which they need to explore. So if it's an exhibition that they've gone to, if it's a museum they've gone, gone to, we would have done a background check and deliberately not highlight certain simple things and ask them to spend some time together and see who is... Uh, uh, alert enough to pick out certain elements that we as uh, the organizers of the trip deliberately ignored. You know, the, the, the element of exploring sometimes can be, uh, can be neglected by someone just going on explaining one thing after the other. I've experienced that and it's become extremely uh, top heavy, sometimes boring and sometimes meaningless and ir irrelevant. The students need to be given that sort of an opportunity and then they would come up with certain things and they would say, what is that all about? I saw that, can someone explain that to me? I said, oh, you saw that. So now let's look at it again. Uh, time for question answers, very, very important. Otherwise it's get on the bus, get off, look at this, go to the next spot. No, no. And even when they're traveling in the bus to somehow uh, wrap up what was their previous experience and open up what's coming up next. Uh, two more points. The post trip is very important. A research and analysis, either through an open evaluation, which sometimes they would be very tired after, you know, if it's like depending on which circle of the concentric circles I was trying to, if it's an international one, wow, they just have jet lagged and all that. So now in, in today's uh, uh, digital world, a feedback form needs to be given where either the parents, students, or collectively they give the feedback and always include future suggestions for uh, further improvement. Um, I, I, I tried to widen uh, Shubayu's question about the, the Himalayas. We have taken children to certain places, uh, but um, uh, I would like to just close my intervention with uh, a quote from the fourth century. And you may say, oh, where is this coming from? You have all seen it on these uh, uh, travel channels whether it is Fox Life or any of these. It is from a Christian Saint Augustine uh, who lived in North Africa, which would be present day Egypt. Now this is the quote. You have all seen it time and again. The world is a book. Those who do not travel read only a page. The world is a book. Those who do not travel read only a page. Thank you. Wonderful, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I think now we have a comprehensive idea of the advantages and disadvantages, so to say. Uh, Surasana, if I may come to you, we earlier had briefly touched upon the idea of a virtual excursion. 
right? I, for one, am not terribly convinced about the idea because to me, excursions will still need me to be in the middle of the experience. But right. with experiences like virtual reality, etc., do you see this happening? Do you see this taking over eventually? A uh, virtual experience or a virtual excursion is definitely, I would say, an add-on. Reason being, uh, sometimes there will be the less fortunate students who cannot afford to, uh, you know, pay up for an excursion. Many a times it happens. So they might want to back out. So we wouldn't want that to be the purpose. Excursion means we want the entire lot. We want bonding. And we don't want any child to feel that there is a difference in levels. So at such times, I feel virtual uh, excursions do play a major role wherein they are almost simulating the whole thing for what the child would experience uh, on going to site. Even though going to site would be the best one. But I feel now virtual excursions are definitely meeting the requirements and it also gives an insight almost I would say if not 100% at least 90% of insight into what exactly is uh, that particular place about or the experience about or the learning about. So virtual experience yes I would say is the second best alternative to take care of uh, the financial crunch and to bring in equality, because this is something we would definitely want to tell the children that all are equal, and also uh, save time and uh, the hassle of you know trying to um, accommodate what is in the calendar of events. Many a times in the calendar of events, I would want to take my children to Rome, let us say. It may not be possible, so I can still simulate it for the children in a short period, and the children also have uh, all the prerequisites plus the take homes after the uh, virtual uh, excursion. That is my take. Um, uh, ma uh, just as we are talking about blended learning, mm -hmm. uh, this idea just popped into my head because if you typically visit a European country and you're visiting one of their uh, monuments, they would give you a pair of headphones and a device which will yeah. keep on telling you about that place in, their, in a language that you are comfortable with. Right. Right. Do you see this kind of a blended excursion possibility? Yes, blended excursion is definitely an add-on to reinforce and reiterate the concepts they learn in the class. Because uh, we are, again, taking care of many things, simulations we are taking care of. Because without that, now, if I'm going to tell the children that, um, you know, this is how a particular, uh, uh, let us say, building looks, and I'm not able to get the children to feel it, but at the same time, through uh, these virtual trips, they get to see the features of that particular, uh, let us say, architect, how it is. They're almost getting a feel of how exactly it is made, keeping certain things in mind. So this kind of a blended learning definitely is going to help them to uh, uh, reinforce the concepts they've learned. It is very, very important because just a textbook or an explanation or an interactive technique or the chalk and talk technique is not going to give them an insight into the total learning that is expected of the child. So it is an important factor these days. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I'll just uh, quickly take one of the questions that we have from the attendees. And uh, Pratima, perhaps as the you know, excursion professional, you could take this one. What types of places to visit for the junior and senior secondary students, which help improve overall personality development? I'm, I'm asking this question to Pratima, but others, please feel free to uh, give in your views as well. Pratima, please. Okay, yeah. Um, so at India Hikes, uh, we take um, students of all ages on treks. Uh, like I mentioned, the lower classes, uh, we are associated with a lot of schools in Bangalore. Uh, where we take the junior students on day treks. So we pick them up from their school, take them to low, you know day treks and we bring them back in the evening. Uh, this also gives them an experience because uh, like you know, the children are quite young and they cannot go too far away without their families maybe. So we do take them on local treks where they can go in the morning and you know we take care of them and we take them on the hike. The same experience is there. You know, we teach them about leadership. We, uh, you know, help uh, tell them the importance of cleaning the trail, about respecting nature. 
Uh, so a lot of their skills are sharpened at the same time, they also enjoy the outdoor experience. But uh, we also do take uh, students maybe above um, uh, seven, eight years old to uh, Himalayan treks, uh, provided there is a professor or a teacher along with them. Um, so we have taken groups of students. Uh, mostly we do students, um, we have special batches only for students uh, from schools like Masuri International School or you know some other schools coming. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, we have a tech leaders, we have a staff. Uh, the, the teachers and professors also come along with them. So Himalayan texts are also possible. Uh, we take care of the entire safety uh, of all the children. So uh, you know lower altitude treks like around 12,000, 12,200 feet treks uh, are possible. Uh, if anybody particular wants to know the name of the treks, I can mention a few of the treks that were there, but they're all in Uttarakhand or in um, Himachal Pradesh. Wonderful. Uh, would uh, Roy sir or Slochanam yeah. want to ask, add to this? I, I would uh, just go back to what uh, Slochanam was saying about the virtual experience. I'm not looking at pandemic times where we have virtual trips per se, but I recall the trip to the Pushpa Gujral Science City, where there was a simulated earthquake experience. And uh, you know, one wouldn't want to experience that in real life, but it was good for these children to enter that uh, area where the uh, ex uh, earthquake was being simulated and to give them a sense of what exactly happens. Likewise, when we took a group to the what was that place, Anandpur Sahib, Virasati Khalsa, with all those gadgets that they uh, put on and uh, everything is explained in such a systematic and uh, a well uh, uh, enunciated manner in the language of their choice, but the entire history of uh, the Khalsa movement. And it was so informative for those who even belonged to that particular background. You know, sometimes we think we know it all. We know, we know our own religious background, but for them to experience that uh, firsthand was, uh, uh, was uh, I mean, uh, you, could, you could tell that these students had uh, benefited immensely. They came away from that uh, entire experience in enriched in their own uh, cultural background. So I just wanted to share that with the group. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have another question, which is an interesting one. Uh, Mr. Sharma asks, how can a blind student do virtual excursion? It's very difficult to him. Uh, if I may, the blind student's difficulty with virtual excursion is perhaps lesser compared to a blind student's difficulty with an original excursion. Uh, however, I'm all ears uh, to hear what uh, Sulochana Ram perhaps would want to say to this. Um, honestly, a very difficult question because it is something, yes, we have to put our heads to think on those lines even because we never think on those lines. Uh, so according to me, the virtual experience can be almost similar to uh, the natural experience because there also their sensory organs, which is nothing but, uh, you know, the sound and uh, uh, they are gifted, basically, they are gifted to go by uh, the magnitude and the intensity of sound waves that can be created in order to simulate a particular thing. Like, for instance, if I'm going to say it's a wave or an ocean, with uh, the children are tuned, basically, to think of what kind of sound would come when it uh, hits against a rock or when it rises. So that also will help them. So this kind of a virtual experience is definitely going to be helpful for the blind students as well. They cannot actually go and feel it even if they are allowed to uh, go to a natural setting. But with the virtual experience, they will at least get to learn what is the wave. I'm just giving a very simple example. What is the wave? When can, when can we call it a, a you know, high tide or a low tide based on their sensory uh, skills? or sensory organs or the uh, kind of, um, you know, um, uh, experiences they can be subjected to do, subjected to in order to learn. It is very different from ours. And mostly according to me, it is sound related. So this can definitely be simulated through virtual experience. So they will not be left behind just because it's a virtual excursion. Wonderful, ma'am. Uh, well, that's all the questions that I have from my end. Uh, if any of you want to uh, add any more points to this discussion, because I know your experience with excursions 
would, would far far out number mine. Yeah, just just to contribute to what Suruchana ma'am was saying, ap apart from the the visual uh, sense, yes, the, the the child would experience the the touch, the smell, the taste, the hearing. So they would definitely partake of the of everything else. And if the organizers keep that in mind, uh, we need to just have a branch of uh, emphasis towards not only the, the visually impaired, but possibly there are other forms of uh, challenge uh, in, in our group that we need to cater to. So Mr. Sharma, who have asked that question, has actually uh, made me think of also the fact that not just having major disabilities or challenges or having uh, children with special needs, but there are some in the group that would have concerns with even things like uh, claustrophobia. And uh, there are so many other things that we need to look at, which uh, brings me back to my trip trick. When we put out this, uh, the, the plan for a trip, we need to really get parents and students to, to list maybe certain areas where they may have concerns, not just only certain challenges that may arise, but uh, we are all aware so that uh, we can, when we take them on the trip, we accommodate everyone in an appreciable manner. Thank you so much, sir. Can uh, I add a is, point, please? Yes, please, go for it. Yes. Uh, yeah, continuing this uh, conversation, because uh, when we go on treks and trips uh, to the Himalayas, um, there's a lot of high altitude issues, a lot of issues like cold and weather, and uh, obviously a lot of health concerns that can come up. So one way of tackling this issue is to, you know, speak to the parents or the students um, who have some concerns. Uh, also, we reach out to them and we interact with them and we understand what their concern is, maybe over a phone call or an email, or sometimes it would come from the parent themselves or from the professor themselves. Um, so most of the time we are able to understand what the problem is and uh, we do have a disclaimer, a hard copy of a disclaimer where we ask the students or the checker or the parent to fill up their problems, their difficulties, uh, if they are on any medication, whether you know, they have any health issues. Uh, so this in a way helps us to uh, understand the situation of the trekker or the student and uh, we are in a better position to tackle these situations. So a brief history of the trekker who is coming, we need to know that so that we know what to do and how to tackle it. Uh, saying this, we've had um, trekkers, I'm not talking of only students and children, but the overall trekking uh, trekkers who come. Uh, we've had uh, trekkers who have had high uh, blood pressure issues. It could be they could have diabetes or they could be asthma patients. Or uh, just a few days back, I spoke to a student who said she's constantly having a cold, a chronic cold, whether she'll be able to go on a Himalayan trek. So we completely encouraged her saying, if you're having a cold in the city, you're going to continue just having it there in the mountains. Uh, you're not going to be uh, you know, affected in any other way. So I'm just bringing back the point that it's always very important to know the history of the person that we are taking. Um, so you know, a form of a disclaimer or something is very important so that the trek leader who is taking the students or the trekker knows the background and can tackle the situation better. Um, saying this, we have found situations where uh, some of them may feel a bit awkward or shy or they don't want to disclose their problems. Uh, you know, they don't want others to know or they, they may feel that uh, maybe nothing will happen to them when they go. But uh, that's actually wrong uh, because uh, when they are out of their comfort zone and out in a different terrain in the wilderness, especially on our um, treks, uh, we don't know the body reacts very differently. So it's very important for them to disclose their problems. It's not that we are going to um, isolate them, but uh, we are going to help them overcome their problems and treat them better, knowing their history. So I just wanted to add this uh, point since we're talking about safety. Great. I think we've had a fantastic discussion. Thank you so all so much. Uh, the wealth of experience that you bring to the table every week. Uh, whenever people thank us for inviting them on this panel, it's our job to thank you for adding so much of wealth to this repository of knowledge that we have been building. The other day, somebody told us that we should perhaps talk to Netflix or Amazon Prime to see if they'll take all the episodes of Together for Education because the amount of education that we have put on uh, just as these webinars, I think is fairly incredible. Well, on that wishful note, Ochin, you have a fair bit to thank people for. So I'll leave you to it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Ochin, over to you. Thank you. So I think... Uh... Really very informative and uh, great session we had. In fact, that, this has been the entire essence of uh, Together for Education webinar. 
you know, uh, sharing of ideas, sharing of best practices. I think this is the entire uh, thing that we thrive on. But sir, thank you so much for giving us a great start and for sharing your first-hand experiences. In fact, when you were speaking about your trip to Pakistan and about crossing the Wagga border, I'm sure, you know, I was, I was just uh, uh, trying to visualize the situation as well as your other trips. So I'm sure it must have been very, very enriching and informative for, for, for your students. Undoubtedly. Surachana, ma'am, I think a very nice point you, you touched upon. The fact that uh, naturally considering practical challenges, like for instance, being able to accommodate a particular trip into the busy academic calendar, or issues with regard to affordability, which are very, very practical in the issues. And the fact that really no child should be left behind. Thus, you know, virtual field trips, blended excursions, and also considering current times that we live in. So undoubtedly, so these things are also uh, coming in in a very strong way. And maybe in, in, in going forward in future, we'll see more of this. Uh, Pratima, again, uh, some, some really very informative uh, points. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, great to know work that India Heights is doing in terms of, uh, you know, uh, taking small children for day trips. And you know, small uh, beautiful things that you shared, like trying to make them more responsible, cleaning the trade, re respecting nature, and as well as it's, I must, I'm sure it must be very wonderful to see them trying to make their own camps or collaborating and cooperating with each other and getting the task done. You know, this is the entire essence of excursion. This is what we are, it's, it's meant for, to develop the spirit of cooperation and to make them more self-sufficient. Roberto Silva, sir. Uh, thank you so much for your time and some very, very nice points you made. Uh, and I'm sure this stays with all our esteemed audience. I think uh, I'm completely with you on this that undoubtedly, you know, if, if we look at the entire uh, spectrum of students, it's really important because if you just try to visualize the situation, undoubtedly, although excursions are, there's no doubt about it, it's beneficial for any student. But especially if we look at disadvantaged students, you know, economically disadvantaged students, for instance, whose exposure or whose opportunity of going for trips, etc., vis-a-vis -vis their peers who, who, you know, are comparatively are in a more advantaged situation economically, per se. So the kind of impact this can create among disadvantaged students is huge. In fact, I'll just share, I'll just take a minute to share a small real life incident. The other day, the other day, there was a gentleman who came to my office uh, for, for interview for one of the very entry level positions that we were looking at. He did a diploma uh, from a local college, said in the vernacular medium, and we are looking at a very entry level position. While speaking to him, there's one thing in his, in his resume that really caught my attention. And it was about a trip to Germany to see Volkswagen factory. So my entire conversation that I had with him, you know, shifted to that. And I asked him that, you know, why did you go there? How did you go there? And, and, and et cetera, what was your learning, et cetera. What I got to know, he was studying in, a, in, a, in an institute which paid for the entire trip. So there are certain parameters based on which he was selected. And his parents, who undoubtedly come from a uh, economically disadvantaged situations, had to pay only a token amount. And the rest of it was entirely borne by his college and some part of it, maybe by his hosts, especially local staying arrangements and everything, sightseeing, etc. He spent a month there. And when he was describing to me, when he was describing to me about some German cities and going by my own ex first-hand experience earlier, I could relate to it and I was just trying to, I was just trying to look at it through his eyes and try to understand the kind of impact it had. And undoubtedly, it had a great impact. So, especially for disadvantaged students, also students with special needs. So I'm sure this needs to be far more inclusive uh, other two great suggestions, I think, sir, you made. One was in terms of research and evaluation after the trip and feedback and future suggestions. These are really very, very important, very constructive in order to ensure that improvement is a continuous process. 
And one comment you made, in fact, is our essence of the evening. So a great quote, that the world is a book, and those who do not travel are really, in fact, they have only read a page. So on that note, I thank all of you for your time today. And I thank members of our esteemed audience for being with us here today. And I look forward to your support in the days to come. Thank you, take care, and goodbye. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure with all of us. Thank you so much.